Hello everyone, in this video we're going to look at the decode ways problem. Our problem is that we've been given a message that is encoded in the following way. An A goes to a 1, a B goes to a 2, a C goes to a 3, and so on until a Z goes to a 26. Basically a letter goes to the order it is in the alphabet. An example of an input message we could be given is 216 and our job is to find out how many ways this message can be decoded. So for this example, we could have 216, which would decode to BAF. We could also have 21 and 6, which would decode to U and F. And lastly, we could interpret this as 2 and 16, which you would decode to B and P. The problem statement isn't too complicated here, so hopefully you can understand what's going on. But one thing to watch out for is zeros. For example, if the input is 0 to 6, we would return 0 because there's no valid way to interpret the 0. However, if we got 206, we would return 1 because there's only one valid way to interpret this, the 20 and 6, which would decode to T and F. Notice that the interpretation of 206 is not valid because there's no way of decoding the single 0. And the interpretation of 2 and the grouping 0, 6 is also invalid because there's no valid decoding for 0, 6. Before I dive into any of the code or solutions, we need to realize that this problem exhibits optimal substructure. This means that the overall problem can be answered with subproblems. Let's look at how we can do this. Let's look at an example like this, just a single one. I'm going to put it in a box to represent a sequence of characters. But for all intents and purposes, you can think of the input as a string. So in this case, the input string would just be a 1. Well, how many ways can we decode this? Well, just one way, which would be decoded to an A. Now let's say we have a 2 in the next position. How many ways can we decode 1, 2? Well, we can decode it two ways, either 1 and 2 separately or 1, 2 together. Now let's say our input is 1, 2, 1. We can decode this in three ways, A, B, A, a, U, and L, A. And now if we have input 1, 2, 1, 2, we have five different ways we can decode this. But let's do one more with 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. For this input, we have eight different ways we can decode it, and I hope you're beginning to see a sort of pattern. You should have noticed that the number of ways to decode a string with index ending at I can be defined as the number of ways to decode the I minus 1 and I minus 2 position. But rather than just observing this, Let's look at why it's true. The reason is that we can decode the number at any given position in two ways. We can use it as just itself or as a pair with the previous index. Let's take this last position for example. The final one can basically be appended to all the ways we can decode 1, 2, 1, 2 to form a way to decode 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. As a refresher, there were five ways we could decode 1, 2, 1, 2. We can take those five ways and put a 1 on the end of it, and now this is a valid way to decode 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. But in addition to that, we also have to account for the fact that we can hook this 1 onto the 2 for it to be interpreted as a 21. This is the second part, ways of i minus 2, because we can now take all the ways we can decode 1, 2, 1, and hook the 21 onto the end of those to form valid ways to decode 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. You can see how this forms the other three ways we can decode 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. There is one important thing we have to notice though. In order for us to interpret the last two numbers as a pair, this number has to be a number between 10 and 26. Otherwise, it can't be interpreted as a pair. In other words, if this 1 here was say a 9, we wouldn't be able to decode this in the second way because 29 doesn't decode to a valid letter. So then our answer would just be 5 or i minus 1 because we're just able to take the first part where we attach a single 9 to all the ways we can decode 1, 2, 1, 2. So this leads us to our first two cases of how we can define a problem into its subproblems. The first case is that if the last two numbers combine to form a number between 10 and 26, we can then interpret this in two ways, so we include both subproblems. The second case is if the number falls above this range, then we can only interpret the i as a single element, and therefore the number of ways is the same as i minus 1. Now these are the two main cases, but we have to be careful. There are actually more cases, and those occur when we encounter a zero. Something like this, where our input is 1, 2, 1, 2, 0. We can divide up the zero cases into two distinct cases. The first is that we can use a zero to either form a 20 or a 10. 
If that's the case, then our subproblem is just i minus 2, because we're essentially adding a 20 or a 10 to all the ways we can decode the i minus 2 encoding. The other case with 0 is that we can't combine it to form a 10 or a 20. And in this case, we can't use the 0 by itself, so there's actually 0 ways of decoding this string. In our algorithm, if we encounter this case, we're going to return 0. Well, now that we've defined our four cases, we should be able to form the recursive top-down solution and the dynamic programming bottom-up solution. Let's start with the brute force recursive solution. We define the function to take in a single string. I've called it code for this function. From the main function, we make a call to a helper method. This helper method has a curve parameter, which represents the current subproblem we're trying to figure out. The original call from decode ways makes a call with cur starting on the last index, and we'll slowly move this backwards until we reach the base cases at the beginning. Before we handle the base cases, let's handle the four recursive cases we were talking about earlier. Our first case is if the current index and the one to the left form a number between 10 and 26. And in this case, we're going to recursively call the cur minus one and cur minus two subproblems and sum them together. The other case is that the number is not between 10 and 26. So in that case, as we discussed earlier, we can call the i minus one subproblem. The third case is that if this cur element is on a zero, but you can also use the previous element to form a 10 or a 20. If this is the case, we return the i minus two subproblem as we discussed. Otherwise, it's the fourth case and we just return a zero. Finally, we move on to the base cases. The first base case is when cur is on a zero index. There's only one way to decode a single element at the beginning, so we return one. However, the exception to this is if the zeroth element is a zero. Then there's no way to interpret a singleton zero, so in that case, we just return zero. And there's one more base case where cur could overshoot into a negative index in one of the cur minus two recursive calls, so we can add an extra case to handle that where we'll return one. We return one because this is kind of to account for the initial two element pairing with an empty string. Okay, well that's all the code for this solution. Let's look at the time and space. The running time is O of two raised to the N, and this is because worst case at every recursive branch, we have to make two more recursive calls, which is the case one I've highlighted in green here. For space, our space complexity is consistent with however large the recursive stack can grow, and this is O of N. Now that we've seen the brute force recursive solution, the most natural way to speed things up is by caching our overlapping subproblems with the memoization technique. So this was our original brute force solution. To use memoization, we first create a memo in our original function, and the memo starts off holding all negative one values. We next need to modify our method signatures so that the memo can be passed in the original helper call as well as the recursive calls. Next, we need to store any values to subproblems that we figure out in the memo before returning them. And finally, we take advantage of our memo by making sure that each recursive call first checks the memo to see if the subproblem has already been computed. If it has, we just return the value in the memo rather than making unnecessary recursive calls. These changes allow us to improve our time complexity to O of n because only O of n subproblems can be made before the memo is used to retrieve values in constant time. Our space is O of n because both sources of extra space, the recursive stack calls, as well as the memo, are on the order of O of n. And now that we've talked about time and space, that pretty much completes our top-down approach. Let's look at the bottom-up dynamic programming approach now. Our bottom-up solution has the same idea as the recursive solution and follows the four cases we were talking about earlier. Let me paste them here just to remind us. But before we get to those cases, let's set up the DP table and handle the base cases. We're going to make our DP table one larger than the actual length of the input to accommodate for the negative one index case we were talking about earlier. So if we're aligning the DP table with the subproblems of the string, then it's the second element in the DP table which aligns to the first subproblem. Our base cases are going to be the first index, which will be a one. This technically represents the empty string or the negative one case from our recursive solution. The other base case is the slot corresponding to the first position. This is going to be a one as well because there's only one way to decode the single first element. The exception to this is a zero. If there's a zero, then there's no way to decode the single zero and we can just stop and return zero immediately. For this example, let's pretend our input string is one, two, seven, two, one. So we're going to fill in the first index with a one. Now we can begin building up our DB table starting at the second index. To do this, we pretty much follow the four cases I've listed to the right. 
The first are the zero cases. If the corresponding subproblem, which remember is shift 1 to the left relative to our db table is a 0, we're on case 3 or 4. If we can use this previous element to make a 10 or a 20, then we fill in this dp slot with dp of i minus 2. If not, we can't interpret the 0, so we can just stop and return 0. The other set of cases are the non-zero cases. If the number can be decoded both on its own or as a pair, meaning it's between 10 and 26, then we fill in the dp table with the i minus 2 and i minus 1 subproblems. Remember, i minus 1 represents taking all the ways we can decode the string ending in i minus 1 and appending i to it. And i minus 2 represents us taking all the ways we can decode the string ending in i minus 2 and appending the i minus 1 i pair to it. And finally, the last case is that we can only interpret the element as a single number. Then in that case, we just add the i minus 1 subproblem. Once we finish filling in our dp table, then we just return the last element, which represents the answer to our overall problem, which is how many ways can I decode the entire string. To better understand how this solution works, I think it might be helpful to go through this example here, where our string to decode is 12721. So let's start in the for loop, where i equals 2. This falls into case number 1, where we can use the 2 itself, but we can also combine it with the previous element of a 1 to form a 12. So we add the i minus 2, representing us putting the 12 at the end of the empty string, and i minus 1, representing us attaching a 2 to all the ways we can decode just the 1, which is just one way, and that's the 1 itself. Now we move on to the next number, the 7. So now the subproblem we're trying to fill in for this slot is how many ways can we decode the string 1, 2, 7. This goes to our second case, because we can't pair up a 27 as a valid decoding. This represents us taking all the ways we can decode 1, 2, which is 1, 2 separately, and 12, and adding a 7 to those two ways. Let's move on to the next case, where we're doing the 1, 2, 7, 2 subproblem. For this case, it's case 2, which means we add the i minus 1 case. This represents us taking all the ways we can decode 1, 2, 7, and adding a 2 to the end of it. And for this final case, we're trying to decode the whole string 12721 now. This is an occurrence of case 1, so we add the i minus 1 and i minus 2 case. Remember for i minus 1, this represents us taking all the ways we can decode 1272 and adding a 1 to it. And for i minus 2, we're taking all the ways we can decode 127 and adding 21 to the end of it. This leaves us with our final answer of 4, which we ultimately return. So now that you hopefully understand this algorithm, let's analyze the time and space complexity. For time, we have a single for loop which does a linear scan, so our time complexity is just O of n. For space, we're using n space for our dp table. Now there's also another solution which uses constant space and takes advantage of the fact that to solve the i subproblem, we only really need the i minus 1 and i minus 2 slot at any given time. So we really don't need the whole dp table, we can just use two variables. I think it might be a good exercise to modify this solution to arrive at that constant space solution. But yeah, with that, that brings us to the end of this problem. To summarize, we went over three solutions, the brute force recursive, which we were then able to speed up with memoization, and finally we went over this bottom-up approach here. The code for each of these solutions can be found on the Knapsack website, which I've linked in the description. As always, if you have any extra questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section below, and if you found this video useful, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel, as all the support really helps. Thank you all very much for watching, and good luck on all your interviews.